welcome to this video. Now, over the last videos of this series, we already added quite some functionality to our Node RESTful services. We added our first routes for products and orders, but we don't really work with the data we get. We, we don't really manage the data. We have no database. We're going to change this in this video. We're going to add MongoDB as a database and Mongoose as a package to work with that database, to store data, get data and so on. So let's dive into that. So as I said, I'll be using MongoDB. You could also use a SQL based database and you can always search for SQL versus NoSQL to find a lot of discussions of, about when to choose which. I'll go with MongoDB here. I might add SQL as a bonus later in this series, but we'll see. And for that, I simply Google for MongoDB to end up on mongodb.com. Now there, we could simply download MongoDB. So if you click on solutions here, you can simply click on try it now, MongoDB 3.6. You can download it, install it on your machine, set it up, connect to it on your machine. You can do all of that. I'll use MongoDB Atlas though. Now, what is MongoDB Atlas? It's simply a MongoDB a database in the cloud, managed by the company behind MongoDB. And we can get started with that for free. Why am I using that? Because if we think to the end, we obviously want to deploy our API at some point. And building a really scalable MongoDB on your own, so a cluster of databases, replicating data and all that stuff is something you probably don't want to do on your own. Now MongoDB Atlas does all of that for you. It's a database as a service and you can work with it just as you work with it or with you as you work with the local MongoDB you can install and you can get started for free. Behind the scenes it's hosted on AWS and as I said, you don't have to pay to get started. So you can simply choose a region here. Now I'll pick an American one, North Virginia. And then if you choose M0 as a size, so regarding the power you have available and so on, you see it doesn't cost anything. Now you can of course pick a paid one for real applications, but for playing around, I'll use that. Now you can see you don't need a credit card to get started. So let's just get started. I'm quickly going to fill this out here. Once you did sign up, you can choose a name for your cluster. I'm going to name this node rest shop because that's what we're building here. You can choose whatever you want. You can choose the MongoDB version though here. It basically, uh, I'll, I'll stick to the default here, the cloud provider. So there you could also switch to a different one, but I'll stick to AWS. The region you want to use on that provider and then important, make sure to select the free tier. So the hourly cost should switch to zero dollars. So make sure that this is selected and you don't accidentally pick a paid one if you don't want that. These are all shared clusters, which might not be the best choice for running it in production, but for development, that's great. And then down there, do you want a sharded cluster? We don't want to take all of that. You can enable backup, but it'll cost man money. Thereafter, you'll need to create an admin username and password. So I'll quickly do that. Obviously you want to choose a more secure combination than I did here. And then you can click confirm and deploy. Now let's quickly confirm that we're not a robot. And this will set up this MongoDB cluster for us though here we really will only have one instance. We'll take a little time. And once it's done, we'll get the connection details that allow us to use it in our node application to connect to it. So even though we're developing the node restful service on our local machine, we can of course connect to this MongoDB running in the cloud. And again, if you feel totally uncomfortable using that, or you don't want to use it for some reason, you can always install MongoDB locally and then use that local address. That's perfectly fine too. Now let's do some useful stuff whilst this is working and let's click on security here. There you see the users you created. You can also whitelist IPs, so IPs that may access this instance here. And I simply clicked add current IP address to add my, well, current IP address or allow access from anywhere. So that of course uh, might not be what you want. You might not want everyone to be able to access this. So choose whichever setup you want. I'll use that though to also be able to access this again once my IP address changed. 
And with that set up, let's go back to overview. And even if it's not finished yet, it is here for me though, you can click on connect here and connect your application. And there you will find the URL you'll basically need to use to connect your application to your instance here. You can click copy here to simply copy that. And we'll need this in our Node.js app. We'll also need to replace the password. And with that, we could see what they suggest us as drivers here for Node, for example. They suggest the official Mongo client, but I'm going to use Mongoose, which is a different package that makes working with data, with schemas, fetching and storing data super simple. So I won't use their official client. I'll use Mongoose, which will build up on this client. So let's leave this page for now and let's go back to our code. There I'll quit the server and I'll install a new package with npm install dash dash save, then Mongoose. That's the package name and dash dash save also creates an entry in the package.json file. Now with that finished, you can now obviously start using it and I will start using it in the app.js file where I wanna set up a connection. Now I will connect to my database here in the app.js file where we start our application. For that, I'll first of all import mongoose here by simply adding require mongoose like that and then here, I'll call mongoose connect. And now to connect, I first of all need to pass a path. And here I'll pass the path I copied from our MongoDB Atlas page. I dare now also need to replace the password, which in my case also is node shop. And typically you might wanna put this into some environment variable so that here you actually access something like process.env. Mongo Atlas password, whatever you chose as an environment variable name. And then you could set this up on the server you're deploying this to so that you don't have to hard code it here into your code. Now to use that with Nodemon, I'll add a new file, nodemon.json, which I can use to configure it. And there I will simply add a env key for environment variables, which is our object. And there we can now define all the environment variables we want to use. Like for example here, Mongo Atlas PW. So I'll add this here as a name and the value will be the password we chose on Mongo Atlas. With that, we should be able to get this dynamically and we don't have to hard code it in our code. Now I'll add a second argument to this connect function, an object where I will set use Mongo client to true so that under the hood, it will use the MongoDB client uh, for connecting, which is the recommended way for using Mongoose when using Mongo version 4.x, which we do on our Mongo Atlas, which is the recommended way of using this when using Mongoose version 4.x or higher, which we do as you can see here. Now with that, let's try it out and for that, let's go to the routes file and then let's say for products when we post a new product with a name and a price. Let's say we wanna store that in the database. Now to do that, I will use Mongoose and for that, I'll first of all need a Mongoose model because Mongoose, and this is no in-depth Mongoose course or video, but Mongoose works with models and schemas. So you define how objects you store in the database should look like and then you create a model based on that, which is just a JavaScript object to put it simple. And then this model will have a couple of functions you can use to save data, update data, fetch data by ID, by other criteria, order it, uh, merge different data sets and so on. So that's what Mongoose offers you for you. And I can always recommend checking out the official docs to which you'll find a link in the video description. So I'll add a models folder in the API folder and there I'll now add a product.js file to define how a product should look like in my application. For that, I'll first of all import mongoose here too and store it in a constant named mongoose. So in that new file. And then I'll create such a schema. I'll create a new constant here and I'll name it product schema. The name is up to you. And I will use mongoose and on mongoose the schema method here essentially to which I pass a JavaScript object which defines how my product should look like. 
Now, my product should have an ID and I'll use underscore ID here, which is kind of a convention, which will be of type, that is how you configure it. The value here is the type of data this will be, which will be of type mongoose, types, and then object ID. That's a special type, which is essentially a, a serial um, ID, not a number, but simply a, a long string. And that's a specific format mongoose uses internally, which we assign as a type here. Then let's say a product should have a name and that will just be a string. So we can use the string type like this with a capital S. Then we also want to have a price, which should be a number. And that is actually all I want. Now we'll export this schema wrapped into a model though. So a schema is like the, the layout, the design of the object you want to use. The model then is the object itself or gives you a constructor to build such objects based on that schema, you could say. So I'll set up module exports here and set this equal to mongoose model. And now that model function takes two arguments. The first is the name of the model as you want to use it internally. I'll name this product. The convention here is to use an uppercase starting character. And then the second argument is the schema you want to use for that model. With that, we got our product model set up. We can now use it in the products.js file in the routing folder. For that, I'll import my product here with capital P here too as a constant name. And I'll import it from my models file and there from the product file, of course, that is where we just defined it. Now here in post, I can use it to store data. For that, I'll first of all create a new instance of that model, so a new product, with a lowercase p maybe, where I use new and then my model as a constructor. Now to that constructor, I pass a JavaScript object where I pass the data for that model. And there I'll need to set an ID because we defined that we want to have an ID here. And I will import mongoose for that with require mongoose to be able to create a new object ID here. New mongoose types and now object ID as a Function, constructor function essentially will give me a new ID, will automatically create one for me. And that will be a, a unique ID, which I can't get twice. Then I'll add a name here, of course, and that name will be my request body name. And I'll set a price, my request body price. That of course means we can remove the old product we created here. Now we got a product object, which is actually created with the help of mongoose. And that's a special object where I then call, can call product save. So save is a method provided by mongoose, which I can use on mongoose models. Save will then store this in the database. Now I can chain a method here, exec which essentially will turn this into a promise. If I don't call that, I would have to pass a, a callback here, an error function where I either have an error or the result of that operation, which I of course can do, but I don't wanna use a callback here. I wanna use a promise. So I'll chain then here. And in there, I will get back the result of that operation, which I'll log to the console. So result. And I also wanna catch potential errors, so I'll also chain catch here, where I get the error, which I then also want to log to the console like that. So this is how I try to save that to the database. Now let's save that and let's rerun npm start to run nodemon again, and I get an error here. You see that I got undefined object ID in my schema file. So let's have a look at what's going wrong there. The problem I have here is I used this a bit incorrectly. This mongoose types object ID is the constructor function, which I correctly use here in products JS here to create the ID. Now to just tell mongoose that I want to use this type, I don't use that constructor function, of course. Instead, I have to access mongoose schema.types object ID. So this is the correct type. With that, if I save this and then I quit 
the server and restart it. Now it should run without errors and it does. And now let's try sending a post request to slash products, which should trigger this route. For that, I'm back in Postman. I'll target products here and I will attach a body to my request. Of course, not product ID and quantity, but instead a name. So here I will use Harry Potter 5 and you can of course also use other products and the price, which I'll set to $12.99. Now let me click send here and I get unexpected end of JSON here because I mistakenly removed that closing parentheses here. So let's send this again. And I indeed get back a response here, created product. And this of course here is the data created by Mongoose because we're returning the product, which is our Mongoose object. So we're getting back the data which was saved to the database, hopefully. Now, if we have a look at our log, we also see this log here, which is looking good. Now on MongoDB Atlas, it can take some time until you see if that really succeeded here in your dashboard, because right now it hasn't, it isn't showing data up to the point of time when we really wrote this. Eventually you should see that you performed one right action here, but we can simply check by always returning that data if we access a certain product ID. So for the get route of products here, I can of course also get this product with this ID. For that, I will remove my dummy code here. And instead I wanna use this product model and that's the object I'm importing here at the top because I don't need to create a new one here. Instead, I'll use a static method on that object, which is called find by ID. And it does what the name suggests. Now I pass the ID to that and call exec, and then I can call then and catch. Now let me restructure this over multiple lines. Now in then I clearly want to get my document and here I'll simply log it to the console for now. And in catch, I obviously wanna get any errors I might face. So here I'll console log an error. Now, right now I'm not sending a response anymore though. And I wanna send a response once we got the data. So I don't wanna call res status and so on after the catch block, because since promises run asynchronously, this would simply mean that I run the code immediately before that response is there because code which I write into this line here will not wait for all of that code to finish. So instead, I wanna send a response from inside the then block when I know that it was successful or also from inside the catch block, but there I wanna send an error. So here in the then block, I'll use res status 200 and I will send back JSON data, of course, and let's simply send back the doc as we get it. So I'll just set doc here as an argument. Now in the catch block, I, as I just said, wanna actually do more than just logging this to the console. I also wanna send a response there. The status code will be 500 though, because something failed whilst fetching the data. And I'll set a JSON response where I will add uh, error property, which is equal to the error I'm catching here. With that, if we save that file, let's try it out. Let's copy that ID we got when we created the object and let's target product slash that IT ID with a get request. Now then let's click send. And I do get back this response really quick. And this does look very promising because to me that really looks like we successfully fetched the data. We changed it here and we can also see that we really have this data from the database by adding from database here. So we're not seeing some old version of our code. If I click send again, we still get the data and in the log we see from database. So this really is our up-to-date code fetching the data from the database. And eventually you now see one connection at least here on your Atlas dashboard. If you refresh and wait a bit, you will also eventually see the uh, reads and writes you're, you're having on that. So we're storing the data in the database. And we're getting it from the database. Now, one thing we can improve is in the post request, right now I send my response immediately. I don't wait for this operation to succeed or fail.
So just like uh, for getting the data, I want to put my success response inside the success callback and I will return the result we get here. And for the error case here, I also still want to log the error here for us, but I also want to send a different response here with a 500 error code where I set uh, JSON or where I sent data in JSON format, where I also have an error property which holds the error we actually got. So that if something failed, we really see that here too. Now let's also try an invalid ID. So I'm sending a get request for ID, I remove the C, which doesn't exist. If I now send this, you see we get an error. And there we see that this couldn't be cast to an object ID because it's actually not just an ID which doesn't exist, it's an invalid object ID and that's detected by Mongoose. If I add a D, which now is a valid object ID but the one which doesn't exist, I simply get back null because that doesn't throw an error and it shouldn't, it's not an error, it's just that we don't have data for that ID. So we probably in our get function want to check for the doc if the doc is there, so if it's not null, then I want to send a response with the doc document. In the other case, I probably want to send a response which is 404, where I have a JSON object where maybe I have a message, no valid entry found for provided ID or something like that. So that now if I save this, we actually have different kinds of answers we can return. We get a 404 answer. You can see the status code here with our error message if I enter invalid ID. If I enter a valid one with a C at the end, I do get a 200 response. And if I do enter an invalid object ID, then I get my 500 response, my 500 error. So this is how we can work with MongoDB and Mongoose. Now we're fetching an individual product and we're fetching or we're storing a product. Now, of course, we also have our general get method where I want to return all products we have. So let's also take care about this. For this, I'll again use my product object up here. And now we can just use find. And if I don't pass an argument, it will find all elements. Now you can also add more query operators here. Like for example, you can add where to add more conditions to that query. Or you add limit to only fetch a smaller number and you could manually implement some form of pagination then. Here I'll fetch all for now though. I'll call access to get a true promise and then chain catch and, and then restructure it over multiple lines. And in the then block, I'll have all my documents, so all my products, and I want to return them. And there, I simply want to console log all docs, and then for now, return the response with status code 200, where I simply return the docs as JSON data. And I'll also catch any errors we might get here, where I will console log the error for us here, and where I'll thereafter simply return a status code of 500 with an object where I have my error again provided to our front end. Now, if I save this, let's try a general get request targeted at products. If I send this, we get back an array with this one object in there. So with this one product, and that's great. Of course, that's coming directly from the database. Now, before we continue working on this get request and before we check which other response we might return in the then block if we haven't any data in the database, let's make sure that we can encounter the case of not having any data there by adding the delete functionality now. So there, I will now also use product, so this model object, and there I can now access remove and to remove, I pass an object which describes the object I want to re remove. And I don't have to pass all properties. I don't have, a, have to pass an exact copy of the object I want to remove, but the filter criteria. And I'll use the ID for that. And the ID is something I can get from my URL. So I'll store the new constant named ID and I get it from request params 
product ID. And that of course is just product ID because that's the name I chose here. So now I'll assign this as a value here. And this essentially means remove any objects in the database that fulfill this criteria. So that have an ID property, which has the value of this ID. And we should only have one object that works like this or that fulfills this criteria. Then I'll execute exec to get a real promise. And I'll chain then and catch now. And then as always, and then I get some result, which I can console log, but I'll here immediately return it, set the status code to 200 and simply return result maybe. Let's name it result to not get into conflicts with the response variable we're using here. And in the catch block, I'll possibly get an error, which I'll log to the console, but where I then also want to return a response with status code 500, where I pass an object which has an error property that then in turn contains that error object we got from Mongoose. Now let's save this. And now if we grab that ID from the object we got and we add it at the end of our URL, we can get the data for that single object. But if we now switch this to a delete request and click send, I get this answer, which I guess means that it worked. It's some um, data about the process that was executed. Let's simply try by fetching all products again with a get request and we get an empty array. So we successfully deleted the data object. That also means something else. We get an empty array and not null here. That's important for our get method here, for our get route. Here, when we fetch docs, we return an empty array. Maybe we want to do that, but we could also check if docs length is greater or equal than zero. If it is, then I want to return my response like this. Else, I want to return a 404 response. And now this is really something you can think about because you could also argue that it's not really a 404 error if we got no data here. So I will remove this in a second, but I want to show that you could use this piece of information. And there you could set up an object return with a message, no entries found. Now again, this is something you can use, but I'll remove that entire check here. I'll comment it out because I think it's not really an error if we got no entries in there. It's not really like we didn't find a resource as it is if we try to query an ID that doesn't exist. Here we just want to fetch all products and it turns out that we got none, but that's not an error, at least in my opinion. So I'll leave the setup we had, but you could use that information that the docs here will be an empty array and not null for this check to return some other response if you want it. So with that, there is one method we have populated and that is incoming patch requests where we want to change um, our, our object, where we want to change data in the database. Now let's also work on that to finish up that product setup here. Now updating is simple with Mongoose. We can again use our product model and then there is an update method. Now to that method, we first of all need to pass an identifier for the object we want to update, just as we had to for delete or for remove. So I'll extract the ID from product ID, so from my URL, and I'll pass the same argument as I passed to remove. I want to update an object that fulfills this criteria that has an ID that matches this ID. Then, however, I also want to change something about that object. Now, the second argument describes how we want to update this. This is also a JavaScript object and there we can use a special property name, $set, which is understood by Mongoose. So this is not an arbitrary name. You have to use $set here to then pass another object as a value to that, where you then describe key value pairs and how to update your object. So for our product, which has a name and a price and an ID, but we don't want to change that. That's the idea behind patching. We want to keep the existing object and just change some properties. But if we change the ID, we essentially have the same as if we would have created a new object. So we want to change name and or price. So here, what I'll do is I will set name to request and now I expect to get this on the body. 
So request body new name maybe. And the price to request body new price. This of course assumes that we always pass both to our endpoint. And the idea behind patch is that we don't have to do that. Maybe we want to just update the price or just update the name. So we should check if we really do want to update both. So for that, let's add some other check first. I'll create a new constant, which I'll name update ops for update operations, which is an empty JavaScript object. And then I'll create a loop here where I'll loop through all the operations of my request body. So I expect my request body to essentially be an array here. Now with that, I can use update ops and add a new property with that syntax here, where I can use ops prop name, because I expect to pass this, and you will see the other side of how we pass the data. So that here will be something like name or price. And I'll set it equal to ops value. This will give us an object that in the end will have this form, but only with the operations I want to perform. So here I can now set update ops. And this will be an object which might have no key value pairs. If we somehow send a patch request without a payload, then it shouldn't change anything. We might just change the name or just change the price. And with this dynamic approach, we're making sure that we can really send different types of patch requests. With that, I can as always chain exec to get a promise and hence chain catch and then thereafter. And then I'll get the result, which I here want to log again. And where I then want to return, and let's again use result here. And then I'll again use res uh, response status with a code of 200 and JSON data, which is sent back, where I will simply pass the result back to the user. And in catch, I'll get a console log where I log the error and then I return a status code 500 with my JSON payload where I have my error property where I return the error to the user. With that, if we save that file, Let's try it out and let's see what happens if we try to patch an object. For that, I'll first of all create a new one. So I'll post to products and set my object here. Quickly run a get request. Fine, so that's stored. Let's fetch the ID. And then I'll create a patch request here. Now for patch, I'll add the ID to the URL. But then I'll also provide a body where I will set the name to Harry Potter 6. Now, if I send this, I get request body is not iterable because my request body here clearly is still an object. And remember, I wanted to use a different approach. I wanted to get an array where in the array we have objects that have things like prop name and value. So let's do that. I'll actually pass an array here as a payload, which I can do. That's also valid JSON. And then I could have multiple objects here. Now I'll have a prop name property in here. Should be between quotation marks though, because we're writing JSON here. And the value here will be name because I want to adjust the name property in my data. And then I'll also have a value property which holds the new value, which now is Harry Potter six. So now if I send this, we get back status code, okay. Now let's see if that really works by going back to a get request and getting the data. And indeed you see the name is Harry Potter 6, the price wasn't touched though. And if I go back and again patch a request, and this time I wanna set the price and set it to, let's say 14.10. If I send this, also get back this scripted response. But if I now get the data for this product, we indeed see the price was adjusted, the name is the same. Now, if I go back one more time and I patch a new body where I wanna set price new, which is a property we don't define our schema, and I set this back, now I get back a different response. And if I get the data for this object, 
you see, this wasn't added. So I can't add new properties like this. I can really just change existing ones. I can't add new ones. And this is of course on purpose. I don't want to be able to add new ones like this. We obviously could rewrite this to allow the addition of new properties, but I really want to work with a set of properties that's known in advance where I can't add new ones. And there was quite some talking and work about setting everything up, setting up Mongo Atlas, connecting Mongoose, using Mongoose, creating a schema and model. But now we get a first draft of how the products routes could work and, and look like if we really use a database. Obviously, this is not final. We might need more fields than just as a name and a price. But it's nice to get started and we already achieved something very important. We got a first version of the RESTful API where we actually persist our data in a database and work with that. So let's continue on the road and let's see which other cool things we can add to this API.